are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. Uh, for today's presentation, our format will be a little bit different than previous SMILE webinars in that I will be serving as a presenter as well as a moderator. I'm joined by Christy Ziganis, who in addition to serving as a friend of our Immunization Coalition, is also the Adult Immunization Coordinator for the Nevada State Immunization Program. We have worked closely together during my time as the state's um, adolescent immunization coordinator where we discussed and sometimes commiserated over uh, the intricacies of working with a wide range of practices to increase immunization coverage rates. The adult world of immunization differs from the adolescent realm in a few key ways, but in our conversations about respective uh, QI projects and grants, we found a great deal of similarities as well. With that in mind, uh, Christy and my goals here today are as follows. Uh, we will prov be providing two separate overviews, first of the adult immunization landscape followed by an adolescent immunization overview, and we'll review a little bit about what Nevada has done to promote high immunization coverage rates in our state. Next, to provide evidence, uh, we will provide evidence-based strategies for increasing uh, vaccination rates, speaking to the different components of each that may be specific to either adult or the adolescent cohort. Third, we will look at the components of a strong recommendation specifically for HPV. And we'll conclude with sharing some resources that Christy and I have found uh, to be especially helpful. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Christy Ziganis. Christy is a graduate, graduate of Sonoma State University where she earned her uh, BA and went on to graduate with her master's degree in counseling. Uh, Mrs. Ziganis's grant management and writing experience in one of her previous roles in the nonprofit sector has led to her entry in the public health realm uh, where, as I previously mentioned, she now serves as Nevada's uh, adult immunization coordinator. Christy, take it away. Thank you, Brianne, and thank you for having me. Um, okay. I just want to put out a blanket statement there that uh, you never outgrow the need for vaccines, uh, but that's not something that all adults are aware of. So it's really important for that provider recommendation to motivate the adults that are unaware or even the ones who are aware but might be hesitant. So in 2013, the National Vaccine Advisory Committee revised the standards for adult immunization practice. The updated standards call on all healthcare professionals, whether or not they provide vaccines, to follow these steps to help ensure that adult patients are fully protected. It starts with assessing. And for our state, because we do have a mandate of reporting, usually that assessment has to do with checking WebID to to look at the patient's official immunization record to see what they have and what they need. The next step is recommending, taking the time to explain the benefits of the vaccine that they're recommending and answering all of the patient questions really goes far in that process. Next is administering if you have it on hand or referring out to another provider that carries it if you don't. And then lastly, the part of the process that's super important is documentation of the vaccine into our state database called WebIZ, and they can either do that directly into the database or into their EMR if there's an HL7 connection. In January of 2009, there was an NRS created that went into effect uh, stating that any immunization administered to a child must be entered into WebIZ. And then in January of 2010, an amendment was created that went into effect uh, to include all adults as well, adult vaccines administered. Now let's take some time to look at the vaccines that are recommended for adults. There are 11 in total as of today, um, and they vary depending on age, immunization history, and medical history. So the next two slides look at the schedule, and it is aimed at the consumer, not the provider. Um, the provider's recommendation schedule comes with a giant list of footnotes to go with it. Uh, so these. Vaccines that are due, of course, flu every year for every individual six months and older, uh, Tdap or Td. Um, the Td is a, a booster every 10 years and a Tdap for every pregnancy. 
uh, the shingles is a, a vaccine that actually a new one just came out and they lowered the age to 50 and that new one has a two-dose series. Uh, there's two types of pneumococcal vaccines that are due starting at age 65 if there's no other medical conditions to deem it earlier. Uh, the meningococcal vaccine is largely based for adults on special medical conditions. The MMR, which is measles, mumps, and rubella, and the varicella, which is chickenpox, are largely dependent on your vaccine history if you've had it when you were younger or not. HPV vaccine, the human papillomavirus, is for both men and women, for women up to 26, for men up to 21 if we're only looking at age, and men up to 26 if we're looking at other factors. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and Hib generally have medical conditions which would require those. So this next slide, which is a little more confusing, convoluted, uh, is based on medical health conditions, um, which would deem whether or not an individual got certain ones early or um, certain ones at all. Now let's take a look at our national landscape of some statistics. For the 16-17 season, flu vaccine for people 18 and up, we had about a 43.3 coverage rate for adults. Uh, for pneumococcal, we had 72.4%, and that was in 2016, and that's just looking at 65 and up. Tdap is at 36.1, and we are looking at adults 18 to 64, and zoster is at a 30.6% for adults age 60 and up. But I do want to put a caveat that zoster 2015 was prior to the new zoster vaccine, and I think that we're going to see our rates grow exponentially with the new one. It has a higher efficacy. So Nevada's rates in comparison to the national rates are uh, flu, we're at a 33.4% for that same age cohort. Pneumococcal has a 65.9% of 65 and up. TD or Tdap has a 50.9% for 18 and older, and Zoster is at 21.5. But again, I believe that we'll see that grow exponentially with the new vaccine. I'd like to move on to talk about some barriers of improving vaccine rates or even just of vaccinating in general. I think that there is definitely a limited patient awareness of the need for vaccines as an adult. A lot of people think that that's a, a kid's thing outside of the uh, annual flu shot. They're just not aware. Um, with adulthood and elders specifically come sometimes a fixed income. So there is a financial burden on patients for that out-of-pocket expense, especially if it's in comparison to, say, getting a medication that they need monthly or buying food. I think the vaccine definitely takes a back burner. Some providers have a limited incorporation of the vaccine recommendation into routine care. Um, I think there are some providers that have a limited or incorrect use of WebIZ, our state in immunization information system. Uh, there was a mini audit done on active WebIZ profiles, and there's a good handful of provi providers who are not reporting at all, and a larger chunk of providers who are under-reporting vaccines administered, specifically the flu vaccine. Um, besides having a financial burden to the patient, there's also often a financial burden to the provider and the reimbursement rates are not as adequate as we'd like to see. And oftentimes they're, they are just what they are, but also in how savvy that provider is in negotiating the contract. Uh, with the older population, there can also be some confusion over the Medicare coverage. Uh, there's four parts to Medicare and Part B as in boy, and Part D, as in dog, both cover different vaccines. And I'll get into that further in a moment. Additional barriers, uh, of course, there's mistaken assumptions about vaccines, but you know, oh, the flu shot gave me the flu one time, it makes me sick every year. And so that really has to do with just education and what's in the media. Uh, there is a legitimate fear of side effects or fear of needles in adulthood that many people underestimate that there are adults who are afraid of that poke. Uh, additionally, with later adulthood can come w uh, a lack of reliable transportation. You know, some people just can't drive anymore due to health conditions or age, and they don't have a reliable source to get them to every vaccine appointment. Uh, additionally, there's a mistrust of medical institutions 
and that can be from personal or cultural experience or historic occurrences. The example I like to give with this one is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, it, they're legitimate and they need to be addressed when uh, making the time to speak with the patient. Uh, as we age, we tend to have multiple specialty providers that we see based on different health things that come up. And this also is an opportunity for that patient to fall through the cracks because which provider should be administering those vaccines if we're not adhering to the standard where it's all providers at every visit. Um, and lastly for this slide, not all providers carry all of the um, recommended adult vaccines. And so having to send them out of the clinic can create a missed opportunity if there's no follow through on that patient side. Moving on to the confusion of Medicare, here's just a brief breakdown of vaccines covered by Part B, which is kind of outpatient services, doctor visits, that kind of a thing. That covers the flu, pneumococcal, hepatitis B for high-risk individuals, and other vaccines based on risk and exposure. You can get uh, the T tetanus in your doctor's office only if there's been a, a puncture wound to the skin. If you're just getting it because it's your 10-year re-up, then you've got to go to the pharmacy, which is the Part D. That's the prescription drug benefit part of the Medicare. And that covers the shingles vaccine, the TD or Tdap, varicella, and most other recommended or prescribed vaccines. A little caveat to the Medicare, though, is that the patient cost will vary depending on that individual's Part D plan and where they receive the service, whether it's in network or out of network. So what has Nevada done about these barriers and the issue? Well, in 2015, the immunization program applied for and was awarded a PPHF grant, that's Prevention and Public Health Fund. It's titled Nevada Adult Immunization Partnership and Improvement Grant. And really the overall objective was to boost adult immunization rates statewide through the implementation of the standards and through expanding access to Section 317 funded vaccines. Section 317 funded vaccines are federally funded vaccines that can be given with no cost to an uninsured adult individual. So anybody 19 and older who does not have insurance is eligible to receive this federally funded vaccine. Um, there were four major uh, focuses for the project work. There was an adult immunization task force created, uh, a large consumer awareness campaign supported mainly by Immunize Nevada. Um, we did focus on expanding the 317 vaccine program. And the largest part that I'm going to speak to more is the provider education. And that came in the form of AFIX model site visits, where I would physically go to the provider's office, we would examine their rates, we would talk about um, adult immunization in general, kind of national standards, state standards, and then we would select a couple QI strategies that were appropriate for that practice. Um, I would give them about six months or so to roll out those strategies and then revisit and re-examine the rates. So to summarize those visits, here's kind of a snapshot of who participated. I had 57 participating sites, and as you can see, there is a variation in the breakdown of provider type. Uh, the pink, the other, were um, a couple mental health facilities as well as um, a couple private, small private practices. And here's a breakdown of the chosen quality improvement strategies by those sites that participated. And as you can see, overwhelmingly, the biggest chosen one was um, uh, roster cleanup in WebIZ. These um, quality improvement strategies were um, pre-selected in a sense that I, I offered here, which, what do you choose from this list unless they had some outside of the box thinking that would fit uh, their practice better. I did notice that with pharmacies, they were more consumer oriented and chose um, ideas such as uh, boosting their signage and uh, talking points to the customer. And as a result of that, 
roughly 60% of the participating sites did see an improvement to their coverage rate that we were looking at, and the average increase was about 14 percentage points. And now not everybody increased, but a good chunk did, and uh, again, that was a, a good solid uh, increase there. So using the traditional ASICS QI model, Brianne headed a similar project that focused on Nevada's 13 to 17 year old co cohort. I'll now turn it over to Brianne who can discuss her efforts. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, in addition to serving as the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, I also acted as the state's adolescent immunization coordinator for the last two years. Um, I'm actually wrapping up the project that I'll be discussing today um, as of uh, this week, and then we'll be exclusively serving as the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, um, although our partnership with the state, or my partnership with the state will continue as we work so closely together. Um, and like Christy, I was going to touch upon the um, uh, birth to uh, age 18 um, immunization schedule. Obviously, we're looking more so for this age cohort from um, the 11 and 12 year old range and up. Um, in Nevada, we um, have the school requirement that students need to have Tdap and then their first dose of meningococcal um, to enter their seventh grade year. Um, so those vaccines, in a sense, uh, take care of themselves with the school mandate. Um, where we really have the most issue is in promoting the um, HPV antigen as, it, as it's not a school mandate. Um, so as a result, our quality improvement efforts at the state and as a coalition have really focused on um, promoting the uptake of the HPV vaccine. And we'll look briefly, um, too, at the immunization coverage. This is just an, a, a kind of 30,000-foot view um, for adolescents specifically related to HPV. Uh, nationally, Nevada is right in line with where um, our, the national rate is 51% of adolescents have not completed the HPV vaccine, vaccine series. Um, in Nevada, the coverage rate for up-to-date HPV is 49% uh, percent for males and females. So we're right on par with the national average. Um, we've done a lot in the last several years to um, help promote the, the uptake of that vaccine. Um, we're still working really hard um, being that that there's only half of uh, Nevada's teens and adolescents who are protected from the most cancer-causing strains of HPV. So we do, um, like the, the rest of the nation or most of the nation, do have a little bit of, uh, of ways to go here, but I'm going to discuss the um, efforts that we've done to um, help promote, promote that vaccine uptake. So with that problem in mind, um, we um, look towards uh, additional funding opportunities as a state um, and partnerships with the coalition um, here locally to uh, help alleviate that. So the problem obviously was low series completion rates for HPV among um, ages 13 through 17 years um, in Nevada. So for um, up-to-date HPV rate for males and females at the time um, prior to initiating the, the uh, project that I headed, um, was at 39.9%. Um, our females were doing um, decent at that time. The males were really um, dragging down that rate, as was true for the rest of the nation. So the desired outcome for, through our efforts was to increase those up-to-date HPV rates and move closer uh, towards that Healthy People 2020 goal of 80% coverage. So previous HPV improvement efforts in Nevada uh, were as follows. We had existing childhood and adolescent AFIX visits. I'll go into um, what AFIX is in a moment um, as well for those of you who are not familiar with that quality improvement model. But um, we uh, partnered with several local um, health districts and um, and other uh, partners as a state as subgrantees to execute those AFIX model um, visits. However, um, our capacity was limited, state funding was limited, and um, we really weren't reaching as many adolescent uh, providers as we would have liked. Um, so as a result, we uh, 
started the HPV Free NV project in 2014, along with our partners at Immunize Nevada, our uh, state coalition. So the HPV Free NV project in 2014 um, had a few different objectives. We did IIS-based provider level reminder recall for adolescents ages um, 11 to 18 years. Um, so this means that we generated reminder recall reports directly from WebIZ, our state IIS, and sent out postcards to patients who were overdue for um, serious completion for HPV. Uh, the second uh, goal or, or objective was to provide um, a jur jurisdiction-wide joint initiative with immunization stakeholders. This took the form of an immunization or HPV task force um, that um, convened regularly to discuss the barriers to um, increasing HPV uptake in our state and to problem solve and identify um, what we could do to um, help providers at their level to increase that uptake. We also had a comprehensive communication campaign. An example of that is that poster that you see to the left. We really focused on, um, again, HPV is cancer prevention. Um, we wanted to disassociate it with any sort of sexual activity um, being that it is a cancer-preventing vaccine. Um, so that was the focus of that ad campaign, and it was really well received. Um, the, six, the project was a, a huge success. Series completion for HPV made significant growth during the time of the project. We were able to increase our female coverage rate by almost 5%, um, and males went up 27% in, uh, by the time the project ended in 2015 versus when um, we applied for the funding in 2013. Um, and this paved the way for future quality improvement projects like the one I was able to head uh, starting in 2016, which is the Increasing HPV Coverage by Strengthening Adolescent AFIX Activities Project. Um, we just have shortened that to the AFIX Teen Grant. Um, our project goals are uh, to improve provider and patient communication, a special emphasis will be placed on the proper way to deliver a strong provider recommendation with, for adolescent vaccines. And that was um, really a, a huge touchstone for the project was just framing that, that presumptive recommendation for the antigen. Um, we also wanted to identify barriers for administering all the adolescent vaccines um, and recognize areas where additional training may be required. And lastly, make use of existing resources to increase immunization rates across Nevada. So a little bit about this AFIX model. Um, AFIX stands for Assessment, Feedback, Incentives, and Exchange. Um, and the assessment involves looking at the healthcare providers' vaccination rates and immunization practices, uh, feedback, um, is the discussion with, of those results to the, with the provider along with recommending strategies to improve those processes, immunization rates or practices and rates, um, incentives to uh, recognize the rewarded, rewarded and reward, sorry, improved performance, and then lastly, the exchange of healthcare information and resources necessary to facilitate improvement. Um, during these AFIX visits, we provided uh, the AFIX questionnaire that has three areas of focus. It's based on the ACIP general uh, best practice guidelines for immunization. Um, the first area of focus that we, foc we wanted um, to hone in on were the strategies to improve the quality of immunization services. Uh, next, the set of questions involved strategies to decrease missed op opportunities. And then the last area of focus uh, focused on strategies to improve the completeness and accuracy of immunization information in the IAS or WebIZ in Nevada. And we'll discuss um, in greater detail the strategies that are associated with each of these areas of focus um, after we do the project overviews here. So here's a summarization of the total visits that I was able to make for the visit or for the project. We um, saw 171 providers over the course of the last two years. Um, generally, they were um, general practice or nonprofit 
um, clinics, so that includes private providers and federally, federally qualified health centers. Um, that was 151 of those 171 visits. And then lastly, we saw um, a handful of public entities, so tri uh, tribal, community health clinics, and health districts with t at 20. Um, and I primarily met with medical assistants um, and practice managers. Um, I also was able to meet with nurses who were on staff if um, the practice did staff nurses and not medical assistants. Um, and then I did, uh, was able to meet with a handful of providers. We saw a greater uptake in the, the number of providers I was able to meet with in the last uh, year or so. Uh, I guess I can't say primarily because we, we offered the incentive of a CME credit. Um, I think it was just simply inviting them to the table um, for these visits and making them aware of what our, our expectations were of them during this quality improvement activity. Um, and lastly, we also met with some front desk staff who are integral um, in promoting specifically the HPV and flu vaccines in practices. They can really make or break um, whether or not a patient, uh, adult, adolescent, or otherwise is going to um, take those vaccines or accept those vaccines. So my personal philosophy behind this HPV quality improvement approach was be to be first collaborative. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the people um, that I were meet, was meeting with were aware that this was a team effort. I was not giving them um, specific tasks that they were to complete on their own without any additional support from me. I really um, wanted to reiterate the fact that we were um, working in conjunction with each other and that literally my whole job was to help them be successful in their quality improvement efforts. Um, second, I was complimentary of them. Um, I think that a lot of the times there's this misconception that as an agent of the state, I would um, was coming in and um, it was some sort of punitive process when really um, I was there to serve as a resource to them. Um, so that is where those focusing on uh, the HPV1 rates really came into play. Um, I wanted to build off the success that they've had to date with initiating that vaccination series rather than focusing um, too much on missed opportunities or um, those parental hesitations or anything like that. Um, we wanted to really hone in on what they were doing well um, and, and set them up to be successful in recalling um, parents of patients who had already initiated HPV. So the most common quality improvement strategies that was chosen by the practices that I was able to meet with was first implementing a reminder recall process for adolescent patients. Um, this again um, focused on patients who had already initiated the series. I just didn't think that it was a, an appropriate platform um, for MAs or front desk staff or nurses even to be cold calling parents of patients who um, had not yet started the series. They think that that's really a discussion that they should be um, initiating with their provider in the event that they have any follow-up questions that um, perhaps whoever's calling isn't able to answer. So again, we're just focusing on patients who have already initiated the series. Uh, the second most common practice, um, strat or, I'm sorry, quality improvement strategy chosen was to inactivate patients in uh, the IIS who are no longer seen by the practice. Um, this was really twofold. I don't love this strategy in that um, the whole purpose of this project was not just to do roster cleanup um, and then make the practices rates look better as a result. It was really to get those patients back in the door and, and complete that series. However, um, that roster cleanup in WebIZ um, for future recall purposes is really important. We don't want to be spinning our wheels, continuing to call patients whose demographic information is poor, um, who are no longer our patients, they've been discharged for whatever reason. Um, so we, I think that that, that um, practice roster cleanup is especially important in that way, so long as they are continuing to recall patients who, um, who need to complete the series. So the outcome of that project um, was really positive. We were able to increase the up-to-date HPV coverage rate by 9%. Um, as it stands right now, the latest NIS Teen 2017 data um, states that the coverage rate for females is, and males for series completion for HPV is at 49% for ages 13 through 17 in Nevada. 
Um, also, we were able um, to increase the up-to-date HPV coverage rate um, by 10%, specifically when we break this down by, um, by males and females. Um, so now it's 53% specifically for females in Nevada. And then we saw an 8% up-to-date HPV coverage rate growth for males um, as a result of, of partly of our efforts in this project. So some Nevada specific challenges, and not to say that this is exclu these are exclusive to Nevada, but um, this is something that we definitely encounter as a, um, as a state. So we are geographically vast. So Nevada um, is really sparsely populated in the central portion of the state. Most of our population resides in the northern and southern um, halves of our state um, with a lot of rural and frontier communities. Um, in between. So um, I was the only one charged with completing these visits, so that required a lot of um, travel on my part. Um, and also with that comes just a really diverse po uh, needs of population, urban versus rural, um, as a result of that as well. Um, in Nevada, um, I, I recently attended an HPV summit here locally that described um, our region of the country is the wild, wild west, and this is definitely true of Nevada. Um, medical autonomy is highly valued in our state, so government intervention of any kind um, is frowned upon, so that just makes our job a little bit more difficult and our approach a little bit different that we need to take um, just uh, as a result. We need to um, both sympathize with that or empathize with that, um, that that being of high value, but also um, convince patients, specifically in rural and frontier communities, that it's not a matter of um, the government doing it for the sake of a mandate. It's the fact that we really are trying to mitigate the spread of vaccine-preventable disease. Um, and then lastly, as far as Nevada-specific challenges go, um, we are, as a state, highly dependent upon federal um, public health funding. Um, we're hoping that with um, um, a reduction, a dramatic reduction in our public health funding um, in the coming years that we'll be able to supplement that at the state level and really prioritize public health um, here, here locally. So I will say that these, these are not um, the most common challenges surrounding the HPV vaccine. Um, I, by any sort of um, official measure. This is really just anecdotal um, from my experiences at the over 170 practices that I've had the opportunity to visit in our state. Um, so the four most common HPV vaccine challenges that I've heard is first, uh, many parents don't, or most parents don't want it. Um, second, um, aside from acute visits and sports physicals, we hardly ever see adolescents. Third, it's not required for school, so it's not perceived as important. And then lastly, um, reminder recall is resource intensive. And so in response, um, I really, again, focus on those HPV-1 rates. In Nevada, we, um, we have a decent um, HPV-1, our series initiation rates. So really, we're looking to capitalize on, on those. Um, so when in response to saying that parents uh, most parents don't want it. Um, we focus on the HPV-1 rates and say that they say otherwise. Um, I think as just it's human nature to focus on you may have 80% of your parents who are okay with initiating the series, and then um, you may have one parent a day that is hesitant or um, absolutely doesn't want it, and in our minds we will always focus on that one parent as opposed to the you know, 79 before them that said yes. Um, so we really need to build upon those successes and focus on the positive. Um, to the second point, um, it's very true. We don't see adolescents aside from um, acute visits and sports physicals. Um, it's very well documented that they're not great about following up with those annual wellness visits. Um, it's just not prioritized for parents anymore, um, especially beyond the, that seventh grade year here in Nevada. Um, there's just no reason for them to go to the doctor in their mind aside from if, if their child is sick or needs a sports physical of any kind. Um, so, I, I, again, I agree with that, but that's, again, why it's our job as public health proponents and healthcare professionals to prioritize um, reminder recall and make that, um, make that part of our daily 
um, practices in these clinics. Uh, to the point to say that it's it's not required for school, so it's not perceived as important. Um, it, that very well may be true, but it's not that parents um, don't want the vaccine. They depend on us to educate them as to why the vaccine is, imp is a priority and why. Um, a lot of the times, parents don't even know that they're behind on vaccination series. So by providing that additional step, by doing that outreach and recall, um, you know, we can get them back in and then possibly um, as a side effect as well, get them in for flu vaccines should it be, you know, seasonally appropriate as well. And then lastly, to the point that reminder recall is resource intensive, it absolutely is resource intensive. It requires a lot of time, um, staff, in some cases money if you're going to be using um, postcards or mailers of any kind, um, but it's also essential. We need to prioritize it in our practices if we want to see these adolescents come back in the door. Um, and, and also to that point, if it's something that we're doing regularly, it's not going to be as time and staff re uh, intensive if we're um, doing it regularly as opposed to just doing it for the purposes of quality improvement. Um, activities like this. Um, so now that we've provided an overview of the adult and adolescent immunization landscape and um, those coordinating quality improvement efforts in Nevada, and also discussed the most common barriers uh, healthcare settings encounter when trying to increase coverage rates for each of these cohorts, let's uh, review some best practices and strategies for strongly recommending and promoting vaccines across the lifespan. Um, Christy and I will discuss some quality improvement strategies that practices who immunize adults or adolescents can immunize. Uh, where you see an asterisk, you'll, I'll be interjecting with some tips on as to how to best cater that particular strategy for the adolescent population when applicable. Thank you, Brianne. Uh, so we've got a good list here, I feel like, running list, um, and some of these we've already touched on. Um, so, of course, to start with a reminder recall, we've both already touched on that, but I feel like it's one of the, the biggest boosters to actually completing a vaccine series or um, just getting a back in for that vaccine. Oh, and I'm sorry, so as far as the adolescent specific advice with regard to reminder recall, um, this is more so speaking to, again, that point that I made that recall needs to be completed um, for adolescents and for parents who may not realize that their um, children are overdue for immunizations and in the event is with Nevada that there's no school requirement that's bringing them back in. It's really um, an essential piece of completing those adolescent immunization series. Uh, moving on, standing orders is also an effective strategy. Uh, there's a great resource at the end of the slide deck here where you can find a template for most vaccines so that you're not reinventing the wheel, you're just signing where it needs to be signed and putting it into place. Um, creating a formal assessment procedure is kind of a, a key in seeing that the individual even needs a vaccine, no matter the age, and so really working out your, your workflow so that you create some room to uh, look in your uh, electronic medical record and web IV to see, to get the full picture of what they have and what they need. Uh, roster maintenance, again, is another one that we've touched on. That's really looking at inactivating patients who are no longer seen by the practice. And how this applies different to the adult realm is that um, really looking at inactivating patients who become deceased or who moved out of state or who've moved to another provider because of a specialty issue. Um, and Brianne has a little bit to touch on that as well. Uh, whereas inactivation for adolescents does look a little different, um, I'm not comfortable with inactivating patients just based on the parameters that they haven't been seen in the practice in a couple of years. Um, specifically for my um, project because it focused on 13 through 17 year olds, um, unless again patients were being seen for those acute or sports physicals, they may not have been in in a couple of years. So again, in order to um, inactivate them, I would be um, it would be advised to at least try to com contact the patient um, a couple of times. If I would say after two to three times of recall, the patient or parent is still not responsive, that would be a good parameter or a good um, 
criteria for inactivating those patients. And then obviously if you're sending out mailers or making phone calls and you find out that that um, demographic information is no longer accurate, absolutely get those patients off your roster um, so that they're not polluting your rates. Perfect. Uh, next up is provide walk-in or nurse-only visits for immunizing, and that kind of goes hand-in-hand -hand with the standing orders. Um, if you're able to offer nurse-only visits so that you, you don't have to charge the administration uh, or the office visit fee, uh, that definitely eliminates a barrier for individuals who might be on a fixed income. Um, one thing that's super effective for all ages is to schedule the next visit before the patient actually leaves the office. It's particularly helpful with vaccines that have multiple doses, such as a childhood series, adult pneumococcal, adult zoster. Moving right along, um, if you get a no-show, uh, reaching out to contact them within the first couple days after that no-show to reschedule has been uh, proven effective in getting them back in. Um, many providers have designated an immunization champion to focus on reducing the barriers and improving rates so that they choose one staff member whose sole focus it is to really um, cheerlead their team and spearhead all of the efforts within the office of uh, increasing their rates. And Brianne has something to add to that. Um, I do, only in that I, I think people get um, intimidated by the term immunization champion, um, and I've said this before in other presentations, but really, you know, you hear that, that term, and I always say if I could give you a medal or a trophy of some kind to designate that that's who you are to this practice, I absolutely would. Um, so don't be intimidated by the title. It's really just anyone who um, prioritizes immunization within the practice, is conducting these recall efforts, um, is in your IIS inactivating patients or, or um, pulling reports of any kind. So um, usually the people that Christy and I are meeting with uh, for these quality improvement activities um, are the immunization sh champions already. They just don't know it. Great. Um, definitely educating patients and guardians about the immunizations and the diseases that they're preventing. And this is where that provider may need to take a few extra minutes to sit down with the parent or guardian or individual uh, to answer all the questions and really stress why this vaccine is most beneficial to them. Um, ensuring that your staff is knowledgeable and comfortable with all current ACIP recommendations uh, is, of course, a great way. Um, people come in and may need more than one vaccine at a time, and if they have that comfort level, then they're more likely to catch them up to date if it's possible in the office in one sitting versus uh, having them re-come back again but also having a great foundational knowledge and being able to uh, share anecdotes or just information um, in addition to that provider's recommendation is definitely helpful. Um, be sure to create a policy of consistent messaging for all staff. And Brianne talked on this a bit earlier that even that front desk individual needs to be bought in on the value of vaccines because it doesn't take much to put the doubt in that uh, patient's mind and send them packing. So uh, from the time that they answer the phone to make the appointment to the time that they reschedule for the next appointment on their way out the door, it needs to be a consistent pro-vaccine message. Um, I've worked with a handful of providers who have um, on their EMR an overlay of a prompt that uh, when they're checking in a patient, it says, hey, are they due for flu or pneumococcal or any number of things? And there are different prompt indicators that can be for age or health condition or seasonal triggers. Um, I found that those are super uh, helpful and important in reminding the provider to uh, check in with the patient and talk about immunization. Um, for those providers who don't carry all ACIP recommended vaccine, Creating an immunization network is where this comes into play. You really have to know who's around to carry the ones that you don't for that referral. Um, and, and within that, there are also tools on how best to refer out. It could be like a prescription piece of paper. It could be verbal. Um, I've heard so far as sending an actual prescription into a pharmacy so that patient goes in to get the vaccine. And I'm sorry, Christy, I put an asterisk in a step, but I don't have anything to add. <laughs> Great. Okay. 
Um, striving, and it's not always a two-to-one ratio here. I just wanted to point out striving for a ratio um, for adult vaccines can be an effective way to boost and catch people up to date. Uh, specifically during flu season, you can use this opportunity to vaccinate with the flu and the pneumococcal vaccine. If the patient is already coming in with their sleeve rolled up saying, poke me, I'm ready for the flu shot, it's a great opportunity to just poke them one more time and cover them with that pneumococcal vaccine. Um, and in same with the ratio for the adult side, I believe there's a, a thought of a ratio on the adolescent and uh, childhood side. There is, and that just kind of follows along with making um, use of every opportunity for immunization. So um, in the event that we have uh, patients in and you do have flu vaccine, for instance, if they're coming in for those seventh grade uh, Tdap and first dose of, of many CWI vaccines that we would um, then capitalize on that opportunity to also immunize with flu um, and then HPV obviously as well. Yep, great. Um, and then another great strategy is to assess your clinic's coverage rates uh, and share it with your staff. It's always nice to know if you're doing well or if there's uh, been an improvement. It's really a good way to give kudos to your practice. Um, and there are various report functions within WebIZ that you can run, um, and there is training offered on that. And um, I would just add specific to Nevada's IAS and WebIZ, we do have a childhood and adolescent AFIX data snapshot report within the reporting tab. Um, this is obviously not going to be applicable to our listeners who are um, listening in from other states, but um, I know every IIS operates a little differently, but there were several states that were awarded funding um, that um, did receive that AFIX data snapshot reporting capability as well. Um, at the very least, um, most IISs have the functionality in that you can pull immunization coverage rate data for, um, you know, that's practice specific, um, and in sometimes even even provider specific, depending on the state's um, IIS functionality. Um, so just make sure that you're well versed in those reporting functions and that you're making the most use of your IIS. Um, those reports are in there for a reason, um, and a lot of the times um, the IIS staff or even your local or state um, health departments are happy to help with any sort of tutorials to cover um, how to uh, best access those reports. And also I would say that it's important for everyone on board to know where you stand, um, at least with the, with, um, the activities that, that Christy and I were able to do with that assessment piece. We did share that, that immunization coverage rate data with those practices. Um, so they got you know, a pretty report to go with um, this activity. But I think in the absence of that, it's important that we're continuously pulling um, report so that you know where you stand, and that also that's anyone that's helping with some of the imp helping to implement some of these quality improvement strategies, that they're one aware of where you stand, and also um, are able to assess how far you've come um, as well. And the last few here. Um, <clears throat> Regularly post vaccine education material on social media accounts. I think Brianne has more to say on that. I do. So if you um, immunize Nevada specifically has a really strong social media presence, and that is 100% um, the credit of that is due to our amazing communications team, both in the north and the south. Um, David Perez and America Davis work really hard to um, to provide relevant and topical and meaningful social media messaging surrounding the promotion of vaccines. Um, so I would definitely look um, to Immunize Nevada's uh, Facebook page, our, um, our Instagram um, presence. You can, you can see on either of those platforms that um, it is effective, and you can use that at the practice level as well. I know a lot of the time practices, specifically pediatric practices, have um, a Facebook page. As we all know, um, most people are on Facebook, so we have to meet parents and patients where they live. Um, so promoting that you're having a flu clinic that's coming up or um, the importance of um, specific vaccination series and just general vaccine education information, um, that's a great platform to use. 
so long I will add with the caveat that you have someone to monitor that as well in the events that in the event that you have um, maybe some discouraging things that are being said on those posts as, as can often happen. Those are good points. Um, moving on to maintain adequate vaccine supply. I think that's hand in hand with the reminder recall. Um, absolutely. So this is important, and I think that this is such an obvious step, but it's obvious. It's honestly something that gets overlooked quite a bit. Um, when we're doing these aggressive recall campaigns, we need to make sure, obviously, that we have whatever vaccine we're, we're recalling or series that we're recalling for um, on, on, um, in stock. So make sure, especially if we're doing it during um, those summer months, especially for adolescents where we see um, immunization rates uh, climb at that time just due to the additional patient encounters that we have prior to school that you um, are also accounting for um, ordering additional vaccine um, related to any campaigns that you're doing uh, with recall. And lastly, um, it could be beneficial to have extended hours for some scheduled or walk-in vaccination clinics. Um, and this goes across the lifespan as well. You know, you've got adults who work that might not be able to get in until the evening or same thing, adults might not be able to take their, their children in uh, during regular clinic hours. Um, and so with that, uh, Brienne is now going to give us some insight on how to make a strong presumptive recommendation for a vaccine that is perce perceived to be the most difficult in the adolescent series, which is HPV. Thanks, Christy. So we've mentioned the phrase uh, strong provider recommendation a couple of times throughout the presentation today, and so I wanted to model um, just briefly what that looks like specifically for HPV. So this, um, what you're seeing on your screen now um, is the exact verbiage or script that was provided by Dr. Noel, Noel Brewer and Dr. Melissa Gilkey at the University of North Carolina, whom I am huge fans of, a uh, fan of. Um, and they provide a really easy to follow script. So you note the child's age. So I see here that Michael just turned 11. You announce that the child is due for three vaccines recommended for children at this age, placing HPV vaccine in the middle of the list. Because he's 11, Michael is due for meningitis, HPV, and Tdap vaccines. Um, and then say you will vaccinate today. We'll give those um, at the end of today's visit. I've also seen it, fra seen it framed in the way that, um, you know, Michael is 11. He's due for these three vaccines, stating them or what they prevent. So, um, you know, this present, um, prevents against uh, meningitis, the most cancer-causing strains of HPV, and uh, whooping cough. And then following it up with, do you have any questions? Um, so I think it's important not to presume, um, again, with this presumptive recommendation, we're just assuming that the parent is going to say yes. We're not going in there with any sort of hang-up. Um, and, and obviously, this, this recommendation um, script looks a lot different than if you were to go into a practice and say, um, and hear whoever is administering the vaccine say, well, you know, Tdap and men men meningitis vaccines are required for school, and if you want, you can get HPV. That looks, that sounds a lot different. Um, it minimizes the importance of the vaccine. It highlights that there's something to be concerned about um, regarding the HPV vaccine, which there's not. Um, and um, again, I think if you just frame it, there's so much research to back up the importance of um, framing the recommendation strongly for HPV, and this is just a really um, easy way to do it. Um, my favorite, um, one of my favorite doctors, Dr. Bob Cosgrove from um, Utah, he, um, I heard him on a webinar recently, and he talks about when he was in practice, before, while he would put his hand on the doorknob of an exam room, he said the script he would say to himself is that, I have a gift to give this patient today, and the gift is cancer prevention. And I am going to go in here presuming that they're going to say yes and expecting that they're going to say yes and know that what I am proposing is what's best for their child. Um, and obviously I'm paraphrasing, but I just thought it was a beautiful way to think about it and to frame that recommendation um, because it's true, HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. 
Um, and then what we'll do to um, wrap up today's presentation, with that being said, is we're going to provide um, some resources that you may find helpful. Christy will first talk about the resources related to adult immunization, um, and I'll follow up with some of my favorite resources for adolescents. Thanks, Brianne. Uh, so I just took my four favorite and put them up here. Uh, CDC has amazing information, um, and I just suggest that you go on there and root around the different pages to see what resources they have. Um, Immunize.org is um, the Immunization Action Coalition, and that is where you can find templates for standing orders, uh, current VISs. Uh, it's just a wealth of resources as well. Um, there's one for the IIS training for our, for our state, and on that page ha you can access um, a link to sign up for training, but there's also a couple uh, manual excerpts if you uh, just need a refresher or um, just want the written instructions on how to do a couple things. And then lastly, immunizenevada.org is a great um, connector for current events in the immunization world in Nevada as well as uh, news, and they have a link on there for the adult toolkit that was created from the adult task force, and the toolkit is um, a resource guide that has information and tools for each of those standards that I discussed earlier. Great, and then here are some of the resources that I have found to be the most helpful in the adolescent realm. Um, HPVIQ.org, this includes tool for um, assessment, feedback, communication training. This um, was um, started by the um, doctors that I mentioned previously, Dr. Noel Brewer and Dr. Melissa Gilkey out of uh, the University of North Carolina. Um, but they've just done a beautiful job with packaging information um, related to presumptive recommendations for HPV. Um, and it's a really great resource for peer-to-peer -peer training for clinicians as well. Um, the next would be um, kind of the holy grail, which is the cdc.gov forward slash HPV. Um, I love the CDC. I love their resources, but um, the, uh, they're not um, the easiest website to navigate, I will say that. So, um, but within that, they do have um, the HPV information portal, and, they're, and I will say also they're working very hard on that too. They're, they're revamping that, those materials and that access all the time. Um, they include uh, parent-focused and healthcare professional-focused materials too, which I love. Um, I just I like that healthcare professionals can go in there and kind of sift through those resources um, because I think asking parents to do it can be a little cumbersome. Um, the third resource that I really like is um, the American Cancer Society's website, so cancer.org. Um, they have vaccine fact sheets. Uh, related to HPV vaccine, um, and then also information for parents on well. They have just initiated an HPV vaccination campaign of their own at the national level, which is really important um, that such a forward-facing organization and well-respected organization is getting on board with the promotion of this um, cancer-preventing vaccine. Um, so we're happy to have them on board in the immunization world. And then um, lastly, um, I would be amiss if I didn't promote Immunize Nevada his website. Um, we also have a toolkit there as well related to that um, project that we initiated in 2014, HPV Free NV. Um, so you can go ahead and access that toolkit. Um, it also has parent and provider resources. Um, and then you can, if you're local, download um, the vaccine promotional posters. Um, I would argue as well, like those posters, the, the poster example that I had at the beginning of my presentation um, would be relevant really for any state or in any setting. So if that's something that you would like to receive, please go ahead and um, contact us as well. Um, I would just like to thank Christy Ziganis again. Um, and before we say goodbye, I'd like to offer a little more time for last minute questions. Um, I have received a couple of questions in the chat box that we'll be sure to address as well. Um, and while we're waiting for any additional questions to be typed in, I just wanted to provide a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing educa education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey, which will pop up on your screen when the webinar has ended, 
uh, or um, in the post webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be mailed uh, out within the next week. Um, it, also, if you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizenevada.org forward slash webinars for those details. Um, we do host this Nile um, Nevada immun Immunization Learning Series um, monthly, um, so we would love for uh, you to continue to participate too. So as far as the questions go, the two questions that we had received, one was from Deborah. She had asked how we were able to obtain CMEs for the providers. Um, so we per, um, basically completed a CME application through the um, University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. Uh, they approved it as an appropriate educational activity. Um, it's only worth one CME credit, so it's not a huge draw, um, but we are, we're looking into um, additionally um, possibly like maintenance of certification, so MOC um, credits that we could perhaps tie onto future activities as well. So it was just a matter of, of putting in the application to our local School of Medicine, um, and at, our, at their approval, we were able to um, tout it as a, a CME um, activity. And then um, the next question was from Julia, question for um, now or for later. She says, can you go more into Nevada strategies for monitoring and interacting with social media posts, especially in the context of comments that have false information? Um, so specifically, um, I know the Nevada State Immunization Program, um, we have one very dutiful um, administrative assistant who posts all of our um, social media posts. Um, she it works with management to, and leadership um, to address any false information or just some kind of um, nasty comments that we, we may get. Um, specifically how they do that, um, I can't speak to that right now um, other than to say that they monitor it closely and, and block, um, block those who are especially nasty or try to correct the misinformation. Um, it's all about when knowing how to, how to engage and when to engage. Um, which is important. So I will look more into that specifically for the, the, um, for the state immunization program, how they do that. Um, as far as Immunize Nevada, again, our communications team um, is just very, and our executive director are just dutifully on top of this. Um, so um, it, it's a lot of, um, it, it, you just have to stay on top of it. It's someone checking those platforms constantly. Um, and I think what's great about our um, coalition members who do subscribe us, to us and follow us on social media is that they're great immunization advocates as well. So they're, they're in those groups, they see those comments, and they are actively um, combating those as well. But again, I'll get with our communications team to see exactly what their approaches are for um, combating some of that misinformation that can be presented. Um, so it doesn't look like any other questions have come in beyond that. Um, Julia, I will send you more of that um, as I can dig into it a little bit more. Um, but I, that concludes today's Nile webinar. And again, thank you so much to Christy Zignis um, and to those of you who participated today. Have a great day.